Now, I kindly invite Professor Dr. Rosemary Deem for her keynote speech to the stage. Thank you. Thank you. So, what I'm going to be talking about is what is happening to doctoral education. So, where is it going? What is it doing? Who is a doctoral student? What are the challenges? So, that's the kind of outline, roughly. So, do changes to doctoral education mirror changes that's happening, that are happening in higher education as a whole? If so, how does it do that? What are the organisational changes to the university that are taking place in the 21st century? What are the changes to the nature of academic work? What are some of the recent developments in, and features of doctoral programmes? What are the criticisms of doctoral education? And where might it be going in the future? OK, so the kind of landscape for doctoral degrees is continuing to change quite a lot. Um, and it's not just something that's happening in particular countries. It's happening in all countries. So there's, there's a lot of people looking at what's happening to the doctorate. And that involves everything from how you fund people to who applies to how you supervise the kind of pedagogies of doctoral education, student identities, student roles, the format of the thesis, internships, interdisciplinarity, a whole set of things. Traditionally, the doctorate prepared for academic work, but increasingly that's no longer the case because only a very small proportion of doctoral candidates end up in academia. So people are starting to look at how you prepare doctoral graduates for other kinds of fields. And doctoral education also reflects many different changes that are taking place to higher education. So that's something else that I want to come back and explore. Because it's not just that the doctorate is changing on its own, it's changing in response to some of those other things too. So if we look at global systems of higher education, and particularly doctoral education, there are actually a lot of different systems, but the three main ones are the European Bologna Doctoral Programme. That's really been developing since the 2000s, that normally it's three to four years full-time. Uh, if it's part-time, then it can be six to eight years, or maybe more than that or less than that, depending on the institution and the system. It includes an oral defence of the thesis. It also includes usually training in methods. And that notion of that third cycle first came through the Bologna process in 2003. Many systems didn't adopt it until a little later than that. Then there's the North American system, which I guess some of you might have experienced. Has anyone got an American doctorate here? No? OK, so the American system is somewhat different because what you do is you start off with coursework, and until you've passed your coursework examinations, you can't proceed to the thesis. So it's different to the European system, which gives the methods training alongside you preparing the thesis. Uh, and that can take, again, it depends on the institution, but it can take up to seven years. That also has an oral defence with a big committee. Then... The Australian system is similar to the European system, except that most Australian universities don't have an oral defence. And as someone who is examined in the Australian system, it's actually quite a frustrating system to examine in, because you get sent the thesis, you send back the comments, but you don't know what the candidate thinks about the comments. You, you then get a revised version of the thesis, but you, don't, you aren't asked to check it which you would be in other systems. So I don't find that a particularly helpful system. Now, there are lots and lots of variants of these systems, particularly the European model. So it's not that those are the only systems in the world. The French also have quite a complicated system, which to only to some extent mirrors Bologna. But again, it's a variation. So that gives you some sense of what's there. OK, so in terms of what's happening, to the system, then what the environment is quite turbulent for higher education, as I'm sure many of you will know from your own countries. Um, and in most countries, although not all European countries, 
it's becoming marketized. So you have a mix of private and public institutions, and there's emphasis on students choosing where they want to go. But often that means paying, uh, and that, of course, comes with its own problems, even though the advantage to the institution is that it gets more money. Universities are becoming much more business-like, so they're questioning some of their earlier purposes about promoting national culture, about being about not just what happens to people in the job market, but also about their development as citizens, their personal development, and so on. Some of those things are being questioned. The economic dimension is becoming more dominant as public institutions become more expensive to maintain. So the social and cultural aspects of higher education are to some extent being not necessarily got rid of, but much more kind of peripheral to the main purpose. And also universities are very heavily managed. A lot of my own work has looked at that and, and the way in which managerialism or new public management have been introduced to higher education systems. Not all systems have that. There's probably less, say, in the American system, but that, that's such a big and complex system that uh, really it deserves an analysis all of its own. So there's also been, not only has there been a shift in the way that institutions are managed and in their purposes, but there's also been a shift in how they're governed. So there's much more emphasis now in, in many institutions and in many systems, not just on academics governing themselves, which is often called collegiality, but also the emphasis on people who are not academics and who are not administrators in the system people from outside, from business, from commerce, maybe from charities and various other organizations who are actually involved in oversight of, of higher education institutions. And it's what Vega and Magalesh and Amaral have called boardism. So you get these people who come from outside who don't necessarily know about higher education making more and more decisions along with senior management of universities. And that creates a completely different atmosphere to the one that was there before. And it challenges the autonomy of academics. You've also got much more diversity in many systems of who actually comes to university. That doesn't always filter through into doctoral education. Sometimes it does, sometimes not. There's a lot more use of, of electronic and other technologies, and student expectations are increasingly instrumental, though again, that doesn't necessarily apply as much to the doctorate itself. But it's not universal, so Richard Budd's thesis on comparing the UK and Germany in terms of undergraduate understandings of higher education found the German students didn't understand the notion of consumerism at all because their system, there are no fees and they don't see higher education in that way and they tend to go to their local institution. Whereas in our system, they can go to any institution um, and they are extremely interested in what happens to them when they leave and therefore they see it in a consumerist way. So, lots of different kinds of universities. Not all, that's a picture, the first slide on the left-hand side is a picture of the institution where I work, uh, which was founded in 1886 as a women's college. Uh, joined the University of London in 1901, became mixed in 1965, and in 1985 uh, joined with Bedford New College. Uh, on the right is Christ College Cambridge. Obviously, that's a very ancient institution, uh, but Cambridge didn't give degrees to women until 1948. The University of London uh, preceded that by quite a long time. So what are some of the characteristics of the 21st century university? Well, firstly, there, there's more of a polarisation around either specialising in teaching or specialising in research. There's a massification of who comes, and that's, that's on, in systems throughout the world. It can be public, it can be private, it might be a mix of either. And as I've already said, markets are growing in significance, but sometimes they're fixed markets, that is, that you artificially organize a market. Um, so, for example, the recent white paper on higher education in the UK actually suggests that the public institutions are a problem, um, and that actually what you, knew, what you also have are other institutions that are wanting to kind of challenge them. 
So what are some of the characteristics of a 21st century university? Well, firstly, this private interest of students tends to overtake the notion that knowledge is important in its own right. And that's quite crucial for the doctorate because the doctorate is obviously thinking about new contributions to knowledge. So if that's no longer a priority in universities, that will affect the doctorate too. Digital technologies, social media, e-learning is no longer something you just give to distance learning students, it's given to everybody. Staff are much more multi-skilled, um, but there's a de-skilling, some people would argue, McFarlane is one of those, um, of academics, and there's a rise of administrative staff, uh, and the functions that they perform increasingly become important because you have a situation in which academic staff do not have time or necessarily the expertise to do all the things that are necessary. And students who act like consumers, so for example in the UK, we have something called the Competition and Markets Authority, which is actually regulating how often and when you can change the content of your courses and the assessment, uh, because you have to give people a long time uh, notice of that so that they do not make the wrong consumer decisions. That's quite problematic in lots of ways. So how do organisational changes to universities affect the doctorate? So supervising doctoral candidates was once something that academics spent a lot of time on, that they might only have one or two students, that it was seen as something special and quite different from teaching a class. But that's no longer the case. Because now people have more and more students, then actually it's seen as exactly the same as, as anything else. It's a routine activity. People don't necessarily enjoy it that much or get anything from it. There's a lot more emphasis on actually students submitting their dissertation or their thesis on time, which in the past I think was less of an issue. And it's not really the concern about the academic content or the contribution to knowledge which counts, but did you complete it? So it might have made not a very big contribution to knowledge, but that's more important than actually ensuring that the knowledge component is exciting. Just get it in and, and complete it. There's much greater stress on collaboration between institutions in a lot of systems, so that you may be supervised by more than one university, and you may also have a supervisor from an outside organisation. Destinations of doctoral holders are scrutinised in a way that in the past, in an elite system, nobody really bothered about that, and probably most doctoral holders went into higher education. Now that's very much not the case, uh, and most of them will not end up in higher education. Although if you look at what people expect, that's not always what they expect. They expect to do that, even though it's not realistic. And the costs and benefits of doctoral programs are constantly held up for scrutiny. So it's not just something that universities do because they've always done it. It's actually seen as something which we have to see, is it actually worthwhile? Does it cost more than the benefits that we're getting from it? Now, I'd also want to look a little bit at recent changes to academic work because that seems to me to be quite relevant to this topic. So there are a number of processes that are taking place in that. So casualization, increasingly academic work is becoming precarious and short term. So in the system I work in, in the UK, over 50% of all academics are on short term contracts. Uh, so that means they have no chance in many cases of ever getting any kind of permanent job. And that's also clearly the case in a lot of other systems. There's been a huge amount of work on this, for example, in the Australian system. Collectivisation is really saying putting together not only research centres, which obviously are not new, although increasingly you get those in, in arts and humanities and social science in a way that you didn't previously get them, but also having things like doctoral schools, having interdisciplinary departments which both teach and research, and, and that means that there's a focus on kind of people working together much more. So obviously that's relevant to the doctorate because the doctorate is a very individual activity. So you do your thesis, you don't write it with lots of other people. But if you think about the world of academic outputs, then increasingly people don't just write on their own, they write with other people. So already some of the things that it tests are actually not necessarily how people operate, even in the academic world. Specialisation. 
that there's becoming, and, the, and this was always present, I think, in, in the American system, but that's a huge system, but not so much in the others, is that you get people specialising in teaching only. That's not new in itself, but it's perhaps become more predominant, research only or management only. So that people might start off as an academic doing research and teaching, then end up on the management route. That's becoming more possible in a lot of systems, although some European systems still elect their heads of institution, and in that system, it's not so possible to have a management career. Academic work, Christine Muslin, who's done a lot on the labor market uh, of academic work, talks about it no longer being as special as it once was. It's becoming more like any other professional work. That is, it's de-skilled, it takes place in, in an environment where other people who are not academics are telling academics what to do. The whole sort of issue around mobility and virtualization, not just mobility between systems in terms of permanent jobs, but people moving around for exchanges and so on. Then in some systems, there are very high turnover. There's a lot of academic travel, which is all, what all of you are doing. And very often, the kind of capacity to work remotely means that academics are not always in the institution that they are employed by, even if that's a focus on face-to-face -face education rather than distance learning. There's also Lee Jerky's work on this speed up of academic work, so that what we used to do in the past, you now have to do much more quickly. And I guess it's illustrated in terms of doctoral education by the fact that, so for example, a student may send their supervisor at midnight uh, a chapter of their work, and they will expect by nine o'clock the next morning they've read it. Well, of course, unless you don't sleep, you probably haven't read it. You probably haven't even seen it. Uh, but the student will expect you to have read it. Now, in the past, they would post it to you or they would send it to you through an internal mail system. It might take a week to get to you. When you did get it, you probably didn't read it immediately. You probably gave it back to them several weeks later. Now, they want what they get from Google. They want it instantly. So that has affected doctoral education quite a lot. It's increasingly digitized. That's good in some ways, bad in others. So how do these changes affect the doctorate? So casualization. Lots of doctoral students end up doing some part-time teaching, sometimes to fund what they are studying, but very few of them are going to get a permanent job in, in whatever system they work in. Collectivization means that Doctoral education is much more likely to be collaborative and to be organized. It isn't just you and your supervisor. Specialization. Doctoral education is becoming a field that people actually specialize in knowing about. That in the past didn't exist. Growth of doctoral schools and colleges in some systems. Mobility of academics means that the face-to-face -face contact, even for institutions which are still teaching face-to-face, gets very considerably reduced because people are just not there. So it means that your contact with your supervisor may often consist of email contact or Skype rather than face-to-face, -face, even if you're a full-time on-campus student. And supervisors have a lot more doctoral students. And of course, that means that it's much more of a burden and that there's much greater pressure for people to finish their thesis because obviously, if you have a lot of students, you want to clear out the ones who are near the end of the thesis so that you can take further students, which in, in the past, when you only had one or two, wasn't quite so much of a pressure. You look at share of doctoral students. This is the most recent data I could find, so it relates to 2012. But the share of, of doctoral students out of all higher education students on Bologna programs in the European higher education area. So you'll see that these systems that have the most are Germany, Austria, Finland, Luxembourg, uh, Czech Republic. Um, so that's quite an interesting distribution. And you can see that obviously some systems, Turkey comes right at, at the bottom end of that. Uh, so the distribution of doctoral students as a share of all higher education students in a system is quite different in different countries. And that may reflect all sorts of things from national priorities to funding opportunities. If you look at sort of beyond the European higher education area, then so in some countries like Switzerland and Sweden, the graduation rates are quite high. 
Um, you get a very high increase in particular systems in, within Europe, like Slovak Republic and Portugal. If you look at the OECD data as a whole, and in 2009, 46% of women received a doctoral degree, but they're still very underrepresented in certain fields, particularly in the STEM subjects. There are some exceptions to that, but they're pretty rare. The largest share of new doctoral degrees is still in science and engineering, followed by the social sciences for men and by health and welfare for women. The absolute numbers of science and engineering degrees have increased very significantly since 2000, but in most OECD countries it's been declining. And the USA, as you might expect, because it's the biggest system, is the largest single contributor of new doctorates in more than a quarter of, of all of the doctoral graduates in 2009, followed by Germany, the UK, and France. So those clearly are the countries that have the most students. And that is probably where the pressure's felt the most by supervisors, because you have a large number of students. When I was at my previous university, Bristol, I had something like 19 doctoral students at a time which is quite a demanding load when you're also doing lots of other things. So, who does the doctorate? What kinds of knowledge? What kinds of people? So, there's considerable variation by discipline, um, and in most, but not all STEM subjects in particular, most doctoral candidates are likely to be male and to be doing it full time. In humanities and social science, there are more women, but there are also more part-time students. And I think it's clear that ethnicity, social class, disability are still challenges in many countries. So if, for example, you have a hearing or visual impairment, it's going to be much more difficult for you to do a doctorate than if you don't. Uh, if you come from a working class background, it's going to be harder for you to get through the previous levels of the system of higher education in order to get a doctorate place in the first instance. That, in terms of gender, that gender affects how students are selected, it affects what you do, it affects how you're supervised and how, you, how it's valued. And that's also quite important because it suggests that doing a doctorate is not just a kind of experience that has no relationship to other social and cultural factors. It has a lot of relationship to that. How you get there, what you do, whether anyone thinks it's valuable are all affected by that. Recent developments in the doctorate itself. One, I would think that there's quite a lot of emphasis now on training people to do research, which in the past, I think, was not really present. And the emphasis then therefore shifts to your knowledge of how to do research rather than your contribution to knowledge, although that's often still a criteria for the award of the degree. And you get different types of doctorate developing. Initially, these were firstly in the US system, but now they're also in quite a lot of European higher education area countries and also in Australia and New Zealand. So you get the industrial doctorate, where the idea is that you do some of your work for an, in, an outside organization. You get the professional doctorate, which has a lot of coursework, which isn't just preliminary, actually counts to the, towards the award of the full degree. So not like the American system, where the coursework comes first before you go on to the doctorate. In, in the professional doctorate, the coursework and the thesis all count towards the degree. So you also get what you get theses that are not monographs, so you have two models for that. One is the, what I call the concurrent model, where you publish as you go along, and the thesis consists partly of articles that you've actually had accepted for publication, or, or have submitted for publication, and, and then there's a kind of wraparound, perhaps, of the kind of theory and methods that you use. But you also can get a doctorate through prior publication, where you present things that you've already published and somebody assesses those to, think, to see if they're of doctoral standard. There's much greater collaboration in supervision, in institutions, across departments than there was before. There is, as I've said, as there are fewer academic jobs, there's much more emphasis on what doctoral graduates can contribute to a wider range of occupations beyond academia. That, of course, varies by country. And there's quite a changing perception in what the role of doctoral students is seen to be. 
This, this is something from the League of European Research Universities trying to model what the modern doctorate looks like. So in their model, doctoral researchers are the drivers of their professional development. They're in a research-rich environment. The boundaries to other research areas are felt to be very permeable, so it's very interdisciplinary. That there are connections to the external world, so the idea is on giving a global outlook to doctoral students. There are a lot of links to other sectors of society. So the skills that, that new doctors acquire are highly valuable to what Leroux calls the knowledge society. There are also a lot of international collaborative doctoral networks. I think probably one of the most well-known in the European higher education area is the Marie Curie Innovative Training Networks, or, or ITNs as they're known. Um, so that's um, something that's been very popular. They're very competitive. They're quite hard to get hold of. But what you have is a group then of academics who get together in different countries to offer supervision. You have a theme. Each, each of the academics will have two or three students each. They, they will have four years to do their training and, and get the doctoral degree. But the idea is that they work together and they don't just work with the supervisors, they actually work with, with all the people that are involved in the network. There's a similar network to that that has been working in the US, funded by the National Science Foundation, which is called IGERT. Um, there are also um, European Union framework program networks of excellence, which involve PhDs in the past. The, in the UK, we have a lot of collaborative doctoral training partnerships across different institutions. All of these are kind of trying to work into this narrative. They're either national or international in, in their scope. They emphasize both the knowledge contribution, but also the fact that as a PhD student, you may not be going into academia. And they tend to produce very employable, globally aware students. I've been involved in, in a Marie Curie ITN called Unique, uh, which is on universities and the knowledge economy. All of the people who are finishing that uh, are extremely employable. They're very international in their outlook. Um, and they've all had significant careers already. In other words, they didn't come straight from a first degree into the PhD. But, of course, these networks are expensive. And so the question is, although they're fantastic for the people who do get onto them, can they be sustained? Because the cost of them is considerable. Policy focus. So what, what is the policy focus in doctoral education in different countries? As I've already said, there's a lot of emphasis on doctoral programs, not just the individual, what happens between the student and supervisor. There's a focus on employability but not the wider social and cultural roles of doctorates, which might have been perhaps more emphasised in the past. The contribution to economic growth is really quite heavily emphasised. The full-time science student model is still very much to the forefront in policy. When people talk about doctoral graduates or doctoral students, that's often who they have in mind, even though in many countries that's not the largest number. It may be the largest number of full-time, but it's never that you very seldom have part-time students in, in the STEM areas because it's much more difficult for them to do the practical elements of the work and to work on projects. And doctoral submissions and completion rates are key metrics but the societal contribution that doctorates might make to the country, to knowledge, to what happens to things, are not usually taken into account. So as long as you submit and complete, it doesn't really matter what it's on because nobody's actually looking at that. They're just looking to see if you've actually completed. So it's a kind of performance metric. It's not a metric of the value of the particular thesis that's been completed. Um, if you look at the kind of notion about what are some of the challenges for doctoral education, then this is the European Universities Association conference in 2016, taking Salzburg forward, talking about implementation and new challenges. So institutional structures are often quite diverse, and as they suggest, there may be inefficiencies in those systems, uh, and that's why a lot of countries have moved to doctoral schools because that makes the experience much more a collective one in which experience can be shared. That there's a need to create space between 
researchers and doctoral candidates so they actually are in a dialogue, not just your supervisor, but also lots of other researchers. Otherwise, there's a danger that doctoral candidates feel that they exist in a kind of vacuum. They're in an academic department or unit, but they don't always benefit from the wider research culture. That there's a need to build research capacity because you want to kind of develop that not only in terms of the, the particular institution, but also the system as a whole. That there's an emphasis on nurturing talent, um, but it's not just getting the thesis done, it's also about rigour, it's about being resilient, because if you are going to use your doctorate in the labour market, you're going to need resilience. It's about originality, very complex concept, nobody quite knows what it means, but it's much emphasised in the criteria for doctoral education. Critical thinking, independence, the ability to create new knowledge as well as to critique what's there already. That there's considerable emphasis on ethics and research integrity. That's the new word for ethics these days. It's, ethics is no longer the, the buzzword. And that it's also about understanding digitalization. And that it's very important that doctorates should be part of the open access movement. Because if doctorates are not available to people, then the contribution to knowledge is going to be very, very small indeed if people can only get hold of it by going through a complicated process or by actually seeing like a typed version of the thesis itself. There's a lot of recent texts on doctoral students. This is just two examples, uh, Nerard and, and Evans and, and Lee and Danby. Lee and Danby are talking particularly about pedagogies of supervision. Uh, Nerard and, and Evans are talking about a sort of broader spectrum of things about the, the quality of PhD education. There's a big debate about overproduction in particular countries. So the criticisms of the doctorate. So, it's not any longer just a preparation for academic work, but even for those who do become academics, people are questioning whether it is a good preparation because it doesn't teach you to teach. Now, in some systems, you do teaching as part of your funding arrangements. That's particularly common in the US system. But even then, unless you actually train people to teach, just teaching doesn't necessarily teach you well. It just teaches you other people's bad habits. But a monograph-based thesis is, is very much the norm in, in all of those systems, but in fact that only works in some disciplines. There are many disciplines where you don't publish monographs at all, unless they're textbooks. So, publishing a mon so producing a monograph in the thesis is quite an old-fashioned way of doing it. And that's why some countries and systems have moved to being also able to have a thesis which consists of, of articles uh, as well as the kind of more monograph type. Um, organization of a thesis. An oral defense, as you saw, apart from the Australian system, that's a very important part of all the doctoral systems, but people start to say, oh, is it too subjective? Well, obviously, any kind of decision on a thesis and whether it passes is subjective, whether it takes place in a debate or whether it takes place when somebody's examining the written thesis itself without the student present. One-to-one -one supervision is beginning to be questioned, and as the numbers grow, then group supervision becomes more likely. Some argue that the professional doctorate could just get rid of the conventional doctorate because it's much more linked to the labour market. And, of course, it is still possible, despite the collectivisation and despite the growth of doctoral programmes, that some doctoral structures can be very small and very isolated, and that's something that the European Universities Association has drawn attention to. So is there a crisis? So Cuthbert and Moller's 2015 um, publication, they're working in the Australian system. So they talk about the shift in the focus of policy on doctorates from efficiency, uh, which used to be the concern, how quickly do people move through the system, to what happens to those people when they leave the system. Doctorates are not seen as a preparation for academic work alone. They have to be about other kinds of occupations, but what kinds of occupations? And do you have to work with those other organisations to get them to understand what a doctoral candidate could actually offer them, particularly if they've not employed them before? People are questioning what originality means. I think that's long overdue because I think that originality is a kind of elastic concept that stretches to fit whatever's available that there's a proliferation of doctoral types in some countries, USA, Australia, UK being examples of that. 
There are questioning about whether different kinds of doctorates actually are comparable, and do they have the same outcomes? If you do an industrial doctorate or if you do um, a professional doctorate, is the outcome the same as it is if you just do a conventional thesis? And are they simply, as, as Randall Collins might have argued, a new form of credentialism that you now need a doctoral degree to do what two decades ago you could have just done with a master's degree? So why do we still have the doctorate? Is it just about traditions? Is it the contribution to the knowledge economy and to innovation? Is it about developing expertise and its application in the wider society? Is it that if you are a scientist, you need postgraduate doctoral students to help you in the laboratory, otherwise you don't have a, a cheap source of labor to do the things that you don't necessarily want to do, but are important to the project? The right to award research degrees is still seen as a symbol of, of university autonomy in many systems, but for how much longer will that exist? Is it about tradition? That's a picture of one of our degree ceremonies last summer. What could we actually change in the doctorate? If we wanted to change, where could we look? Well, we could look at who we recruit, so that we could place more emphasis on people who might become future leaders, uh, and who are very versatile in what they can turn their hand to. We could look at how we fund, so we could have fewer candidates, but more generous stipends. That's probably not very likely in, in the current financial climate around the world. How do we train and supervise? More emphasis on co-supervision. We can offer more substantial international experience during the doctorate. That, I think, is increasingly important. What are we preparing doctoral candidates for? Are we just preparing them for a job? Are we also thinking about broader citizenship, about social and cultural and political roles, as well as careers? Because in many countries, if you look at who goes into political life, it's often people with PhDs. So thinking about the entry into politics is really important. The kind of knowledge that doctoral candidates produce, and for whom that work is for, and, and perhaps, as Sheila Jasanoff has written, that we need to think more about co-production, that the producing of the knowledge in a doctorate is not just the candidate and the supervisor, but maybe also policy makers and other organizations outside. And what do the doctoral students themselves do? So Balaban, in a review article published this year, traces a shift in how student roles in the doctorate are regarded, but this is more from the kind of institutional perspective, I think, than from the student perspective. So Gold et al. talk about students as stewards of their disciplines, that they are the people who take the discipline forward. That's quite a conventional academic interpretation of, of the PhD. Walker et al. Et al. talk about shared uh, apprenticeships between supervisor and student, whereas Nerod and Evans talk about students as future leaders in many fields. They talk about global collaboration, they talk about transferable skills. So, although, although some of those things overlap, there's a very clear shift from the kind of notion that doctorates are about academic knowledge only, and therefore the students who are doing doctorates are contributing towards keeping that discipline going and, and developing the discipline, to the notion of doctoral students as potential leaders, not just in the academic field, but in lots of others, having those kind of global qualities and, and skills that enable them to work in lots of different contexts and in lots of different jobs. So, what do we think is happening here, and why are people questioning that? I think it's because many authors see stu doctoral students as very ill-prepared for life after the doctorate. Indeed, if you've ever interviewed recent doctoral candidates for jobs, all they talk about is the thesis, but the people interviewing them aren't really that interested in the precise content of the thesis. They're interested in what you can do for them, and that's particularly the case if you're going outside, but it's also true in academia. That U.S. studies suggest that over time, students' career preferences shift from wanting an academic job towards private sector or other non-academic jobs. But there is often a problem, particularly in the STEM disciplines, that the supervisors regard students who go on to non-academic jobs as inferior. And so they were trying to encourage people to go into academic jobs, even though there aren't very many such jobs. In the U.K., the vast majority 
of PhD students still want to be academics, despite the fact that it's probably going to be the case that less than 5% of them are actually going to end up with, it, with any kind of long-term job prospect in, in higher education. In Germany, a lot more PhDs look to, to jobs outside academia, possibly because they are pushed to finish their PhDs fast and because they often have internships in industry, which prepares them for that alternative life. Um, but then finally, it might be worth remembering that professional and industrial doctorate candidates often already have a job, which they may not have got rid of in order to do the doctorate. They may be continuing that. So their kind of career prospects are very different, and they may simply want to progress in the same field they're already in rather than changing route. So is it really the case that the doctorate is a mirror for the changing university? So where are we actually going? So... There's clearly going to be a lot of different organisational forms. The whole of the doctor, in some sense, is being disassembled, so you can separate out the recruitment, the teaching, the training, um, what happens to people afterwards, preparing them for future work. All of those things can be kind of disaggregated from each other and could be done by different, different organisations. There's a much higher focus on programs with fast, efficient delivery. So that's clearly not the doctorate because it's not a particularly efficient way of, of delivering higher education. There are far fewer permanent staff. So there's casualized labor. Maybe you know, universities will end up with robot tutors. You can do lots of things with robots already. Mostly those are quite menial things. But in the future, perhaps they could teach undergraduate courses. I don't know. Technology-driven rather than technology-informed. So the whole notion of everything being digitized, the notion of learner analytics replacing personal tutors, that research could in future be done by artificial intelligence. The flip lecture is the norm, so you no longer need someone who can actually contribute significantly to the knowledge content because somebody else could produce that in a textbook or online, and all the tutor does is simply to explicate it. Research and research-informed teaching are only at the elite institutions. They're not at the others. So can you unbundle the doctorate? Well, obviously you can. You can separate out different methods um, of doing things. You could, super, you could get people from outside the university to supervise. You could use online monitoring to make sure that doctoral students do what they continue to do. You might eventually just in the end be able to buy a kit in a shop or at an airport. It's called the PhD kit. You activate it with your credit card and everything is provided by different organizations. We aren't there yet, but we could get there. So I've looked at how organizational changes to the university and changes to academic work have had an effect on the doctoral degree and vice versa. I've looked at some of the recent developments and features of doctoral programs, including the proliferation of different types of doctorate, collaborative programs, and the changing roles of doctoral students. And then finally, I looked at criticism of the doctorate and the notion of a doctoral education in crisis. So, as universities continue to change, I think doctoral education will continue to change. If there are fewer research-intensive universities in the world, there may be more selective admission, to full-time doctorates in particular, not, doesn't necessarily apply to part-time or to professional or industrial doctorates. Private for-profit providers don't see doctorates as a priority, but they might be interested in unbundling because they may need PhDs for some of their teaching, so they might be interested in contributing to some aspects of their training as, as a sort of contributing organisation. Knowledge production and collaborative schemes will, will continue to grow, but they're very much tested by kind of inter-institutional competition, I think. Um, so that becomes a problem because as institutions compete with each other for things like league tables, they don't always want to collaborate over PhDs because that splits the uh, credit that's available for doing that work. And we could consider even establishing cooperatives running PhD programs. That would be a very real possibility. So if the doctorate survives, and I think it probably will, but it may change a lot, candidates need clearly to be prepared for a much wider role than the role that they previously expected that they were going to get. That they're gonna, the challenge is going to be to that notion of originality. How much can that be stretched out? Obviously, doctoral candidates will need much more preparation for the digitized world, the precarity of, of many jobs, not just academic jobs, but all jobs, 
that they need perhaps to have better translational skills. How do you translate the knowledge in the doctor into something more useful? Uh, transferable skills as well. That co-production and collaborative thesis may become the norm because clearly that notion of an individual working on their own is becoming quite old-fashioned in many disciplines. And equally, we could be heading for doctorates written by artificial intelligence. So I don't know who would get that job. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I would like to thank. Sorry. I would like to thank Dr. Rosemary Dean for this nice and valuable and exciting uh, keynote speech. Uh, and this is the end of keynote speech and plenary session. Now you are invited to welcome coffee. After uh, the welcome coffee at 9.30, uh, the parallel sessions will begin. Okay, thank you. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, uh, there will be questions. Okay, if you, if you want to ask. Sorry again. Okay, uh, thank you, Professor, for this introduction. Uh, I'd like to ask two questions, actually. The first one is uh, you have pointed to, uh, to a certain point that training PhD, you emphasize uh, training PhD more than knowledge. Have you meant that uh, there is an emphasis on the technical uh, PhD uh, writing, style of writing? I think it's so much the skill of writing, although I think there's now an awful lot of books out there which tell people how to write the PhD, which didn't exist before. Um, I think I'm more thinking that it becomes a training in research skills rather than a training in the contribution to knowledge. So the emphasis on, is on what skills you need to do a piece of research, and the test is more can you do research unaided in the future rather than is the actual academic contribution of your thesis a significant one. Now, of course, in the criteria for doctoral education, th those are often combined, but I think there's a shift in what, what is actually being emphasised. So, in, in, this, in the past, in, in all of those systems, maybe less so in the American one because of the length, but in the others, the emphasis was often on making sure that academic contribution occurred, even if it took a very long time. And I'm not talking about people doing part-time theses, I'm talking about people who start off doing it full-time, might take 15 years to complete. And it was regarded as, as your great work. Whereas now I don't think anyone thinks that the work you do as a PhD student is going to be the best work you ever do. Of course, if you don't stay in academia, you won't necessarily do research again. But if you do, it's almost certainly not going to be the best work you ever do. It's just a starting point. So that the balance of the relationship between the training and the knowledge component is shifting. Now, it depends on the system, of course. But there's definitely more of an emphasis. But it's not so much on how to write it. It's on whether it's a preparation on how to do research or is it actually the contribution to knowledge itself which is being emphasised. That's where the shift is taking place, I think. Okay, thank you. This is the first one, if you don't mind. The second is, uh, what about the postgraduate uh, system or programme? We have, we have in, in some countries, there is a postgraduate or postdoctorate programme. Postdoctoral programs. Yeah. Yes, I mean, post, yes, there are some postdoctoral programs, and indeed the Marie Curie system has postdocs as well as PhD students. But they're much more common in the STEM areas. They're not so common in, in arts, humanities, and social science. So, but obviously, and a lot of that is actually partly it's giving people further skills, but it's also a kind of holding bay because there aren't jobs. So if you do a postdoc, then it kind of extends the period that you're attached to higher education. It doesn't necessarily get you a job. So, but I mean, that was, I wasn't really looking at those. But I think that you need to look at where the, what areas of disciplines they're in and also what is the purpose of them. So I think then that starts to raise other kind of questions as well. Thank you very much uh, for that wonderful presentation. My name is Dr. Joshua Manduku from Kenya. Uh, I want to ask a question. Uh, you mentioned that academic work is no longer special as, as it used to be, which is quite true uh, because you find that 
uh, people in other sectors may make more money than those who are in academics. And like in Kenya, when you look at the situation in Africa, which you did not actually look at in your study, you find that we produce very less PhD holders. Mm. Uh, the, the, the national requirement per year is about 1,000 PhD holders, but we only produce 300 for all the universities combined. So how can we make academic work more attractive so that we can attract so many PhD students? Thank you very much. Yeah, I mean, I think that, I mean, it's an important question, clearly, for developing countries, is, is how do you actually make sure that academic work is seen as a realistic option? I think the problem is, what, I mean, obviously, firstly, it's how much you get paid, but I don't think anybody enters an academic career because they think they're going to be, become very rich, but obviously it has to be enough to be enough to live on. So if people become an academic, but they also either need three different academic jobs or they need an academic job and other jobs in order to, to live, then that's not going to be very helpful. I mean, I think the only way is, is actually to think about how you nurture the university because that in those kind of systems where the number of doctoral graduates is very low, then clearly the question about them going into other fields doesn't really arise because there aren't even enough to fill the academic positions. But maybe people have to think about, and that's where perhaps the earlier question about postdocs becomes important, is that you need something after the doctorate maybe to encourage those people who do want to continue to kind of develop further skills and think about where they're going to go. That, that might be, but of course all of those things cost money and of course many developing countries don't have money. So I think that is a really difficult challenge. I mean, it's a very important question. I don't think there's an easy answer to it. Hi, thank you, Brother Rosemary, for a very informative uh, presentation. I am Dr. Thurey Aid from King Saud University. I was interested in your comment about the Australian PhD examination system do not have oral defense. How is it problematic to the PhD graduates? Well, I think it's problematic in lots of ways because I think that one of the things that happens in, in an oral defense is that it, if it goes well, and obviously one hopes that they go well, then it becomes like a kind of private seminar between the candidate and the examiners. And that, that's a kind of very valuable occasion for all sorts of reasons. Firstly, because it allows you literally to do a proper defense of your thesis. It's not just dependent on what the examiner reads, it's also dependent on what the candidate says. And often the criteria will say that the outcome is the thesis and the oral defense. It isn't just the thesis. Clearly in the Australian system, it's only the thesis because the other bit doesn't take place. So I think the benefits are partly having that dialogue, but it's also because in that context, the examiners can, for example, suggest future academic directions for your work, can suggest places that you might publish. None of that is going to take place if all you have is people writing things about the thesis. So I think there are a lot of advantages in the oral defence. And I think to get rid of it would be a problem. Of course, there are different kinds of oral defence. It's not a single system. So the typical European system is it's an open viva, uh, where anybody can attend. I, in the UK system, however, it, it takes place largely, there's a couple of institutions where that's not true, in, in, a, in a kind of private context where there's just the examiners, the candidate and the supervisor. So there are different systems, but I think that having that oral defence is very important. I also think it's important because it seems to me that without, if the examiners have criticisms of a thesis, then in an oral defence, you get to find out whether the candidate even understands what your criticism is. And if they respond well to it, that may affect the decision that you make at the end. If you don't have the candidate in front of you, you don't know how they respond to it, so you may end up giving a harsher decision than you would have given had you been in an oral defence. Okay, thank you again. Thank you, Dr. Lim, for this nice conversation and keynote speech. Okay, this is the end of the opening session, and now it's real. You are invited to the welcome coffee.